Welcome back. This morning we're going to look into writing a IRC bot in Haskell. Because what else would you do if you were wanting to learn Haskell and wanting to write an IRC bot? Now if I remember correctly, um, I did find a uh, IRC bot framework somewhere on GitHub. I don't exactly remember where, so we're going to do it live. Um, in the sense that, whoops, that's not what I'm looking for. Um, I'm just looking for a simple old IRC bot, something that I can attach to the Twitch IRC server. Um, so here I have a Discord bot. Here, everybody likes to show off their knowledge of the language. Um, I'm just glad to find a variety of examples to select from. Um, I don't suppose that this is... nope. That's not a full example. Alright. Haskell Discord bot for the FP Discord server. Well, this is a Discord bot. That wouldn't hook up to an IRC server. Um, Alright. Hmm. All right. So we have a variety of bots to select from, I suppose. Um, I guess this one only works on a given site. Um, so that's probably not what I'm looking for. I'm curious what Vindinium may be. Ah. This is a special sort of role-playing game. It's a AI programming challenge. You have to take control of a legendary hero. You'll fight other AI under a predetermined number of turns, and the hero with the greatest amount of gold will win. That's special. Not exactly what we're looking for at the moment. Alright. Is this the one I found the other day? I think so. I'll give it a shot. So I think I've installed the Glasgow Glasgow uh, Haskell compiler. Um, so, so okay. Do I want to type this all out from scratch, or can I download the example and then follow it? Um, I guess we're doing this from scratch, guys. Huh. Did I not find, um, hmm, 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 bot is an experimental arrow-friendly foundation for functional reactive programming. That may well be, GLIRC is a, uh, is a Haskell client for IRC. Now, I thought I found something on GitHub. Could I be mistaken? Um, I know if I search for Haskell, that's not nearly restrictive enough. I'm just being lazy and seeing if I can find a pre-compiled or pre-written example. Um, ah, is this the one I found? IRC Twitch Chatbot HS. Basic Twitch chatbot written in Haskell to configure, etc., etc. is adapted from the example that we were looking at a second ago. Um, and so let's, okay, read through the example. Oh my goodness. Could I get a dark mode for this page? I don't suppose I can. It'd be nice if I could. <sighs> Find more styles for this site. Um, wait, is this Haskell.org? Okay, yes it is. Um, which of these look like an appealing dark theme? Maybe this one. Last updated 2015, unfortunately, but 
As long as the site doesn't change too much, that's okay. Let's install this style. Wait. Did I not install the style? Strange. Oh. Only applies to learn you a Haskell. Um, can we manage installed styles? Learn you a Haskell. Uh, that's nice and all. Um, I want that to also apply to the Haskell wiki. Uh, nope. Nope, nope, nope. Remove section. Add. URLs on the domain. wiki.haskell.org. Alright. Save. Ha! <laughs> that was overly optimistic of me now, wasn't it? Bummer. Um... And if I say Haskell.org? Yeah, I didn't think so. Alright, well, um, let's remove this because I'm not using Learn You a Haskell. Um, I suppose that should have been my main consideration. It's like what works on the Haskell wiki page. Um, I was more fixated on what looks elegant, but... Okay, we'll give this a shot. Does this work? Um, well, okay. It's a little bit better. Not the entire screen. The entire screen's not all white. But the coding example got garbled here. So if I could find a better theme, that would be better. Um, dark closures. Does this say what site it works on? Applies to Haskell. Hmm. I guess it's worth a shot. So let's turn off this theme. Come on. My mouse loves to double click, by the way. Fine, we'll just delete the theme. Say it doesn't work. I'll try this one instead. Beautiful ish. Um, I might tweak the colors slightly, but this is a much closer fit to what I'm looking for. Hmm. Alright, this tutorial is designed as a practical guide for writing real-world code in Haskell and hopes to intuitively motivate and introduce some of the advanced features of Haskell to the novice programmer. Our objective is to write a concise, robust, and elegant IRC bot in Haskell. First, you're going to need Haskell. Um, and then write code to get on the network. So let's start by importing the network package and the standard I.O. library and finding a server to connect to. So here's two import statements to connect to, or import the network package. Back, so they don't use module is their nomenclature, they use package as their nomenclature. Um, so and then you got the system, uh, here they call it standard IO, here it's called importing system.io. Um, I guess you could have other, in fact network is a form of IO, it is a standard. So we're talking about system standard input and system standard output. Um, so then you define your server, your port number, and then here you define main do. Um, now, I have to remember, sure, uh, this is functional programming, um, but that's not to state that you don't need to declare things in uh, sequence here. So here we're declaring that b is the result of connecting to a server or this is the this is when you evaluate the function of connecting to server 
the result gets um, evaluated as B and then um, you want to set buffering of uh, I'm sorry that's an H there isn't it anyway set uh, H to no buffering um, yeah it's interesting this isn't exactly this is more written in imperative style um, but the notion is that you're not going to write all of your Haskell code in this manner. Um, just things having to do with I.O., with making a program useful, uh, happen to be a bit um, diverging from the whole functional programming w way of looking at everything. Um, Whereas most of Haskell code doesn't accept any input, doesn't, well, could produce output, but where would it go? Probably to standard out. So you were, uh, for a number of years, Haskell programs didn't have a really great way of accepting input. Um, so you need to specify the data. Anyway, I, I'm not so familiar with Haskell in that regard, but I know... Um, monads and such did introduce the ability for Haskell to interface with external interfaces at runtime. So you could define essentially a recipe of uh, for this input produce said output. Um, um, and that's basically what's going on here is that the output of connect to server is getting evaluated to H and then H is getting passed as a parameter to uh, uh, set buffering, uh, as well as no buffering is getting passed to that. Um, and then get contents of H is getting evaluated to T, and we could print T. All right, and so it says the key here is the uh, main function. So main is the entry point to a Haskell program. We first connect to the server that set the buffering on the socket off. Once we've got a socket, then we can read and print any data we receive. Put this in the module 1.hs, and then we can run it. Use whichever system you like, uh, using run Haskell. Um, or you could just compile to make it executable with GHC or GHCI Interactive, or in hugs. Great, we're on the network. Now we're listening on the server, we better start sending in some information back, um, such as the nickname, or the nick, which is the IRC concept, username, and a channel to join. So we send these as well. So, Let's see, we've got network system IO printf just for convenience. Um, so here we define, yeah, you know, your channel, your NIC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we connect to the server, no buffering. So we write NIC, the user, and the channel. Um, and what do we have down here? So you have got right handle IO. Hmm, interesting. Oh, I guess this is where we're defining right, as opposed to here we're assigning main to the result of this function. Here we are defining right, which is a. Well, I guess this is also a function. So what gives? I guess we're being we're defining the input and output parameters of said function here, whereas main is not so tightly coupled or bound to static types. So right accepts a handle. Um, I'm confused by the arrow notation here, right, with a handle, with a string, with a string, 
producing IO, if I'm understanding properly. IO and Scala, or I'm sorry, not Scala, Haskell is a bit tricky. All right, so I guess we're going to see an explanation down here. We've done a number of a few things here. First, we've imported um, printf just for convenience. We've also defined our channel name and bot nickname. The main has been extended um, using a write function. Let's look at the write function more closely. We've given it an explicit type to help document it, and we use explicit type signatures from now on. Is there good? practice, though not required, of course. Um, write accepts three arguments. I handle a string and a string, right? Um, representing an IRC protocol action and any arguments it takes. Write then uses hprintf to build an IRC message and write it over the wire to the server. Um, for debugging, we also print that to standard out. And our second function, listen, as uh, of this form, accepting a handle, doing IO. Um, again, this is a, I want to say this is a monad function. I'm not sure. I have not studied category theory. This accepts a handle argument and sits in an infinite loop, as stated up here. Again, this is taking an imperative style, um, which compared to uh, Scala makes me a, a touch nervous because I just am not so familiar with this language and its syntax. But okay, we have an infinite loop, um, but I guess a loop dealing with I.O. in a functional programming language is okay. Um, we take advantage of two powerful features, lazy evaluation and higher order functions, to roll our own loop structure forever as a normal function. Um, takes a chunk of code as an argument, evaluates it, and recurses. So this is an infinite loop. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness, this, I don't like this explanation at all. No. Um, while uh, I'm not sure how best to explain it, but you're right that it takes a chunk of code as an argument, evaluates it, and recurses. And I guess you could call that an infinite loop, but calling an infinite loop function is its making me worried. Um, by convention, it would be called an infinite loop, but there's no guarantee that it's infinite. Um, I guess other than there's no way to inject code into a Haskell runtime uh, to replace existing code. So there's no, in this higher order evaluation, it's suddenly encountering another um, class that extends this and deciding that that definition of forever replaces this definition of forever. Um, so I guess this is infinite. It's very common to roll our own control structures in Haskell using higher order functions. Um, yeah, I, who wrote this? Oh my goodness. This is not a good introduction to Haskell. But, I don't know, the coding example itself is okay. And these additional imports, data.list and system.exit for changing the listen function. We add, th okay, this coding color is just not working. I'll have to, I should have experimented with this before the stream. We've still got half the page to go. So let me see if I can fix this up. So inspect this element. We're going to look at color white. No, that's not what we want to look at. Inspect 
background here. There we go. That'll do. I'll just turn off the background color for that. Um, if ping s, then pong s. Um, no, is there some way I can also deal with the color of this being purple instead of something more useful? Like, I don't know. Let's change this to something a bit lighter. Um, 588 is not good enough. How about 58F? How about, I don't know, 5FF? That's better. Um, and we still have some black keywords here. Can I pick a different color instead of black? Um, how about not black? Is not black okay? All right. Um, still a bit dark. There we go. And then things like this. Oh, that is just black space. Okay, how about this punctuation? Could we turn off coloring of that punctuation? And this punctuation, let's turn off coloring of that. There we go. That's a bit more readable. So, add these imports before changing the listen function. So forever do all this input where forever equals, forever A uh, is evaluated as A shift forever A. Um, so if ping S, so this is like dynamic dispatch matching, I think. No. This isn't dynamic dispatch. This is not Scala and it's all its complications with matching. This is us defining our own function clean and our functions ping and pong. Um, so yeah, if S, um, let's see, let S equal init T, um, I'm a bit confused about the definition of init. Let's see. Oh wait. All right, so T is equal to get a line from H. So this blocks and waits on input, eventually gets a line out of H or some sort of exception is thrown saying that you've lost your connection. Um, and then let S equal init T in it probably being some predefined um, just get me the first word sort of thing. If uh, S is ping, then respond with pong, else evaluate um, H of clean S and put string S. All right. I don't see a definition of put string string here, or put str ln, hmm, interesting. So if ping, then pong, this is useful for servers that require pings um, to keep uh, clients connected. Before we can process a command, remember that the IRC protocol generates input lines of this form. So we need a clean function to drop the leading character and everything up to the next dot, uh, leaving the actual command um, content. This seems like super unwise. This, um, uh, that, that, I guess you have to define your own way of cleaning that isn't quite so naive. Because a person could put a colon in the middle of a line. Uh, so you should clean things in a less naive fashion, but that's okay. 
Uh, we then pass the clean string up to eval, which dispatches bot commands. So if the single string quit is received, we inform the server and exit the program. If a string beginning with id appears, we echo uh, any argument string back to the server. id is the Haskell identify d function, which simply returns its argument. Okay. Wait, is that? That's not part of this example up here. They didn't explain this example at all. Oh my goodness. Um, wait, where is eval? Okay, here's eval. So eval h, h being our handle, clean us. Um, oh, I see. So both of these, h and clean us, are parameters to the evaluation function, which is able to evaluate things like exclamation point id. Um, so yeah, this is the definition of eval just built into the Haskell language. That's cool. Either that or eval is our own evaluation function that we defined somewhere else and I just didn't see it, but whatever. Um, so then we add the private message function, a useful wrapper for write, for sending priv message uh, lines to the server. Here's a transcript showing example usage, um, very pleased to meet you, quit, roll your own monad. Small knowing so far is that we've had to thread around our socket to ever, yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of necessary, but you'd prefer to just write your own monad to do all the interesting stuff. Um, and not fixate so much on the input and output aspect of this as this application has done. I would be perfectly content, whatever. Let, let's see. So to find a small state monad. Yeah. Um, firstly, to find a data type for the global state, it's the bot type. Uh, wait, didn't mean to scroll there. Okay. In this case, it is the bot type, a simple struct storing our network socket. We then layer this data type over our existing IO code with a monad transformer. This isn't as scary as it sounds, and the effect is that we can treat the socket as a global read-only value anywhere we need it. We call this new IO plus state structure the net monad. Reader T is a type constructor, essentially a type function that takes two types as arguments, building a result type, the net monad type. Let me reread that. This um, has not been the easiest reading ever. So the bot type is the global state type. Um, We call this new IO plus state structure the net monad. Reader T is a type constructor, essentially a type function that accepts uh, two types as arguments, building a result, the net monad. Okay. You can now throw out all that socket threading and just grab the socket when we need it. The key steps are connecting to the server followed by initialization of a new state monad, and then to run the main bot loop from that state. We add a small function, which takes the initial state and evaluates the bot's run loop in the, in the net monad using um, the, this run reader t. This, oh my god. 
I'll just stick to reading the code because this English description is horrendous. Um, it gives very, well, it's a very mathematical description. I suppose that that makes sense for, I don't even need to belittle the author or anything like that, but, um, I mean, this does lay plain the fundamentals of what you do to um, use a monad and a monad transformer. However, um, this does not explain to somebody unfamiliar with the language what the heck is going on. So, because I've studied compilers, I can take a stab at figuring this out without the English description, which really does nothing other than repeat the description above. It tries to use fancy terms to explain what's going on. It really... You'd have to have a familiarity with Haskell. And if you had said familiarity, you wouldn't be reading this example. You would be writing your own. Um... All right, so a uh, data type of bot is a, so yeah, this is the global state that contains a socket of type handle. And uh, net is a type. Um, this is, this it says that reader T is a type constructor that accepts the two arguments, um, the bot and IO, and produces a net type. So net, um, net weaves the two of these, um, bot and IO together. I'm sorry, reader T weaves these two together and produces a type of net um, without limitation, like, here we see that bot has a, a global state um, with just one member of socket. Here, the way this is written, this does not limit um, the membership of type net, uh, at least not explicitly. Now, this doesn't explain why it would be useful to do such a thing. Um, other than now we have a net monad type. Um, so I guess this, this hadn't really introduced the concept of what is a state versus what is a type. Um, that differentiation hadn't been really spelled out here. And that seems like a pretty fundamental thing uh, to want to explain to a person interested in coding in Haskell. Um, and I'm sure we'll run into an explanation like 35 paragraphs down the line of, oh, by the way, the difference between a state, like a data here versus a type is that you could have multiple, um, uh, I don't know, I'll say references that are of a given type, each of which contains a separate state. Um, whereas there's only one state by the name of bot. Um, you could produce other states that also contain a socket, um, but bot will always contain this one socket, or something of that form. Um, anyway, this says, because we have a monad and a monad transformer and we use some 10 letter words, we can throw out code. The key steps are connecting to the server, followed by the initialization of our new state monad, and then to run the main bot loop in that state, we have a small function which takes the initial bot state and evaluates the bot's run loop in the net monad using um, the run reader t function. Um, now again, here we've got reader t, here we've got run reader t. Um, I guess run reader t is an implementation of reader t. Um, or an explicit declaration, or I don't know what you want to call it. But yeah, we see data type of net is reader T with these other two types. Well, no, that's that's not a type, this is a state. And IO um, 
I assume refers to system IO that we imported. Um, or it could just be a generic IO type. I don't know. I gotta say, I'm not impressed. But okay. Um, where run is a small function. While we're here, we can tidy up the main function. You know, I'm not learning anything from this. I've heard in very abstract terms before I started this stream, basically what Haskell allows for. Um, and basically the notion is that a monad would be, um, well, okay, say, say you got a functional programming language where it can evaluate functions like one plus two. It's always going to evaluate to three, no matter if you do lazy evaluation or no matter how that evaluation occurs, it's always going to evaluate to three, unless you happen to override the plus operator or some silliness like that. Um, you have a functional programming language that has a factorial function. You can implement um, four factorial and it'll always multiply four by three by two with a result of 24. You have a functional programming language that's count the number of primes uh, that are under 100, that sort of thing. You can define all these uh, mathematical expressions as functions. Um, and you don't need to worry about how they evaluate. Um, the problem with a functional programming language of that form is that you can't do input and output with it. IO is like one of the more, uh, well, so what would it mean to have a functional programming language that dealt with IO? Well, you'd want to define a recipe or a monad for how you accept input and translate that into output. So then you could say program execute my recipe. Uh, so you could call numerous instances of a program and for each identical input, it would produce an identical output. Um, okay, I'm just going to hope that this is better co uh, commented than earlier stuff. I really don't expect it is. Yeah, this is not a great explanation of how the code works. This is probably good code, but my god, the explanation suffers so badly in that you basically have to understand Haskell in order to understand said code. Okay, let's add a new command, uptime tracking. Conceptually, we need to remember the time that, that the bot started as a user requests. We work out the run, total running time. Um, so you introduce into the state of the bot a start time field of type clock time when we modify the initial connect to also set the start time. So this defines, again, a monad for um, when we are doing a connect, we want to get the clock time and uh, that evaluates and gets stored as T and then uh, the return type of connect, I'm sorry, the return expression of connect is going to be create a bot state with uh, H handle and T start time. And then we have add a new case to the eval function to handle these uptime requests. So yeah, you can inject all your special evaluations um, into this eval function and uh, it checks like does this happen to match one of my commands that I know about and if so evaluate that otherwise just evaluate this using the standard eval function and that's it running the bot with this new command where to now this is just a flavor that's a special way to spell flavor that lets you know the person who wrote this isn't in the US um, it only hints at the power of Haskell's lazy evaluation, static typing, monadic effects, and higher order functions. There's much, much more to be said on these topics. Some places to start, 
Well, considering I didn't enjoy the first five sections, I'm not going to trust you now. Even though some of these, I'm sure, are like Haskell.org. I know that's a good resource, but this is not where I would go. Or take the bot home and hack, except this also won't tell you anything about how to learn Haskell. Don, don, don. Um, yeah, this is not an idiomatic tutorial. Um, it does use a lot of 10 letter words, but it, it doesn't explain how it all works. On the other hand, based on this example, oh my goodness, this is not the cleanest way to start, but, um, yeah, we have this, the IRC Twitch Chatbot HS. Now, have I forked this already? I think I have. Yes. So I didn't have any special aspirations with this bot, um, but let's clone or download it and see the extent to which it runs. Get clone this project name. Cool. Um, and I might handle the rest of this offline. So this readme file is the same thing as um, this readme. Note there is no license file here. I'm assuming that the author's acting in good faith. I should probably add a license. I'm not sure which, maybe the MIT license, maybe the GPL, maybe, I don't know. Some kind of license. MIT is probably a reasonable one to select for this. Um, is there any license that was provided here? I don't suppose there was. Uh, simple permissive license. Okay. This looks very much like the MIT license. Um, yeah, so... Whatever. Um, all right, so we got a make file. So make compile calls the compiler make using hider uh, odor. So this is output directory build. I'm not so sure what hi refers to. It's not like an input directory. Build, build twitchbot, twitchbot.hs. Um, I'm concerned by the case of like some of this here. Twitchbot.hs starts with a capital T. Everything else here is in lower case. I guess that's okay. Um, so if I say compile this, Failed to load interface for network. Use dash v to let's see a list of files to search for. Um, okay. Sure, why not? Um, perhaps you meant, okay, well, this is wonderful. <laughs> About everything that could have gone wrong has gone wrong. Um, interesting. Then again, I picked a pretty ambitious um, project for my first Haskell project, so um, should I have expected any of this to work? Probably not. Um, so... Can I make progress with this, or should I just wrap up now? Hmm. <laughs> All right, so... Chasing dependencies. Hmm. 
deleting temp files, checking old interface for main, parser main, field load interface for network. Okay, so I believe I do have, well, of course I have the compiler installed. Um, apparently I don't have the network uh, package installed. So this must be a pretty common failing, or at least I can't be the only person uh, who's ever incurred, encountered said error message. Um, so how do I use cargo to install the network package? Um, oh, I need to make a cabal file. Or at least there should be such a file, whether or not I need to make one. <sighs> this reminds me, like, I have used the corrode tool to cross-compile from C to Rust. Compile is the wrong word, but translate. Um... And therein, I have had to deal with um, making sure I have the correct uh, packages installed. Okay, so I've got a conversion of Cabal installed, right? Um... Ball install network. Uh, update. Get the package list from Haskell.org. And then from said package list, we're going to attempt to install network if unless um, this can figure it out, I guess. Um, yeah, install network. There we go. Now, I'm not sure where I'm going to get source.conversions and control.monad.reader from. Um, perhaps you meant control.monad.fail from base. Um, well, we'll see in a second if that came with network. Um, okay. Uh, control dot monad that fail do I need to install controls nope 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 um, yeah I'm not sure which package contains control dot monad dot reader um, <laughs> Either I've got some really old version of Haskell installed, or I don't know what's going on. Um, oh wait, this is the same question, isn't it? Um, what version of Cabal do I have installed? One dot twenty four dot o dot one, and we see one twenty three o one is development version. Um, hmm. GHC version. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure where I obtain um, this package from. Control Monad Reader. So this is the module name. Now where's the package name? Stability experimental. Lovely. <laughs> that's that's exciting. Um, all right. So where do I get this from? Monad reader class. 
This doesn't really answer my question of where I get it from, though. Um, the Monad Transformer Library. Um, install Monad? Surely this could not be something I'm missing, right? It's such a popular aspect of the language. Uh, Cabal search monad. Um, Oh, more commands up here. Nice. Update, install, help, info, list, fetch. Um, and if you have a package, you can do all these things with a package, but I want to find said package. Um, list packages matching a search string. So if I want uh, info monad, uh, there's none called monad. Um, info control. All right, so can I get a full package listing please? I know it's more than I could possibly bear, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure how else I identify uh, the package listing. Okay, can I just say call info? No packages requested. Um, file targets, yeah, okay. So basically I can't figure out where to obtain dependencies from. Um, ball install conversions. That, that's too exciting. Um, Oh, actually, um, cat make, cat make file. So if I supply an additional parameter here, I can see where it's searched for source.config and source.conversions and all of this. Um, fail to load interface. Like, I can't have been the only person to encounter this. So either this is like experimental Haskell that we're talking about, or, um, or this is just like a non-standard library or something of that sort. Call configure, build and install, fine. I suppose that's worth a shot. Oh, that's if you're building your own package. Um, maybe I'm dealing with an older version of a way to specify um, packages and that a newer version of Haskell, these are just built in keywords or something. I don't know. I'm clearly very confused. This is like the most terrible example that I could have possibly started with. I'm always seeking to do something especially ambitious. Um, and I think this time I just bit off more than I can chew. But what's new there? Um, I'll think more about this. I'm sure the answer will come to me. It's just not coming to me in the real time that we do this stream here. Or 
in the case that you're watching this in video form, um, it's still not occurring to me right now. But probably by the time you're looking at this video, I'll have already figured it out. If not, um, either way, feel free to provide feedback. I'll certainly accept it. Um, I'll tinker with more with this offline, not leave this dragging on here. So, um, yeah, we successfully read through documentation about how to produce a IRC bot um, using Haskell. Um, and aside from the fact that like the code was tricky to read, didn't explain anything in any more detail than I already knew about, and didn't really finesse um, the greater capabilities of Haskell and show off why it's such a beautiful language to do things in. Um, and aside from the fact that I couldn't get the code running because my environment's not set up properly, um, it was a shining success. Yeah, we'll have greater successes next time, some things that might actually help elucidate um, just what it is that makes Haskell great. We're going to make Haskell great again. Uh, sorry. All right, let's see it. Thanks for watching. I'll keep tinkering with this, figure it out somehow, and see you next time. Take care.